We join with the psalmist who wrote, Sing to the Lord a new song, because he has done wonderful things. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Welcome to today's service of worship. Whether you're with us here in person, joining us live on Zoom, watching on YouTube channel, or listening on the radio at some point in the future, we are glad to have you with us. For those in person, I invite you to please find the pew pads, fill those out, pass those along to see who's worshiping with you, near you, to get all the updates and information that are in there. There are many different opportunities to be able to connect with one another, to engage with our community, many different things going on in the life of our congregation. If you have not already, I invite you to get signed up. Make sure that you're signed up to receive our newsletter, the Wednesday updates, the Sunday reminders that come out. Get that information. It's always changing, always new things. We're in the process of updating our website, so keep an eye on that. We want to try to make it a little bit easier for you to be able to access all the information, social media sites, all of that stuff. So if you ever have a question trying to find information and it's not there, you can always pick up the phone off the wall and dial the rotary on it and call into the office. As long as the phone system, digital system here isn't all down, then we'll answer. Be able to answer those questions. Go back to old school ways of doing things as well. Today, I will be leading the Growing Connections class starting at 1015 in the fellowship hall after our fellowship time. This is going to be the first in a series of three classes that I'm offering for membership, whether you're someone interested in becoming a new member, finding out what it's all about, or if you've been a member here for your entire life, I invite you to come and hear what I have to say and let me know what you think. I'm going to start out today giving kind of that big picture, looking at the whole of history and how do we fit into it, how does God fit into it, and what does it mean to worship, which that will also connect in with today's sermon. If you are interested in becoming a member and can't attend all three, let us know. We're going to be trying to record them on Zoom. Should be available on Zoom as well, so we can find ways to get caught up on all that stuff. And also, we are continuing our Lenten lunches. Those start at 11.15 a.m., so you can stick around and enjoy some soup or sandwiches or whatever it is. If you haven't signed up for it, that's okay. Come on in. Enjoy it. These are going to continue through the month of March. Feed My Starving Children. We've got public sign-up. It's going to be starting on Tuesday, March 5th. If you want to get a jump start on it, if you haven't already, out in the narthex, you can sign up there. There's a big t-shirt. Right next to that is a sign-up sheet. Get signed up, and that way you get in ahead of time on that. At this time, we've collected $4,000 of the $38,800 needed for this mobile pack. How much, Jennifer? $14,000. All right, excellent. Typo, missed the one on there. So $14,000. <sighs> I'm a little bit less anxious on that one. I was concerned thinking, okay, this is coming up very close. So it, mobile pack will be first weekend in April. I believe so please do sign up for that it's a great time and great ministry to be able to help get food to starving people around the world who really need it and the funds go all to the food so it's great also huge thank you for the loaves and fishes on this past wednesday 157 people were served and all the warm clothing and the blankets that we had were handed out. So great ministries that we have here. Again, if you want to get involved in any of those and looking for more information, get signed up on the newsletters, the information coming out. Check out the information out here in the Narthex. Today being the first Sunday of the month, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Now, no one should ever feel pressured into partaking of this holy meal. If you desire to simply sit in the pew to not partake, that is perfectly fine. That is your choice. But we also want everyone to feel welcome, to feel that, yes, it is open to all who believe in Jesus. You don't have to go through a test first to find out 
are you acceptable for us? No, God's grace is there in the mystery of this holy sacrament for all. We've had quite a few questions in the first month and a half that I've been here as to, are we ever going to change how we're doing communion? Are we going to always be using the little prepackaged kits, or will we ever get back to doing things the way we always used to do it, which I'm finding the way we always used to do it depends on who you talk to. So we're trying to please as many different people as possible today. It's going to be maybe a little bit confusing. That's okay. In the midst of all the chaos, God brings order. So today for communion, we will have servers up here at the front and we'll start out on the side. I'll go through as we get to that point, refresh. We'll offer the opportunity if you'd like to come forward to partake by intinction. We have one common loaf of gluten-free bread for everyone. It has been specially made for this. And you can use that, take a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, return to the side, and then we will serve the two center sections after that. Ushers will guide you when you should be going, all of that. If you still would like an individual prepackaged kit, that is fine. Those will be available up here at the front as well. If you do not want to walk forward and you want to remain in your pews, that is fine as well. Mary will be coming around with a tray of the prepackaged elements as well. Simply raise your hand, get her attention as she's walking around, and she will serve you in your pew. So there will be some confusion, some chaos. Hopefully it's all fairly orderly. Doing this as an experiment, seeing how it flows, what we can learn from it, how we can improve, and maybe it'll be absolutely perfect and no changes. We'll see as we go through. Knowing that God is present, the Holy Spirit is present, may we calm our minds, open our hearts, that we might be reconnected with the triune God as we worship together. Please rise for the call to worship. The world finds no proof of God. God's message is foolishness to the world. The freedom of the world brings us death. We gather in the name of Christ crucified.
We read in Hebrews 7, 25, Jesus is totally able to deliver those who approach God through him, since he is alive forever and thus forever able to intercede on their behalf. Complete Jewish Bible. Reading to this promise, we lift our voices before God, confessing the sin of the world. Patient Lord, we have cluttered the temples of our lives with so much unnecessary things that they have blocked out your healing words of hope and mercy. We have been keenly aware of our economic situation. We have spent much time and energy worrying about these things. Forgive us when we have been so preoccupied with these things that we have not listened to your words that followed your ways, clear away our fears and frustrations. Please take a moment for silent confession and reflection. Give us clean hearts and spirits. Help us to be confident in your mercy and transformational love. These things we offer in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Rejoice and know that you are forgiven. Let the clutter of your life fall away and be replaced by the fullness of God's mercy and God's love in Christ Jesus. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with others that are here this morning. responsive psalm reading today is from Psalm 19. I invite you to respond by reading the bold face print. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming his handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words, their voices can't be heard. 
but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach the end of the earth. God has made a tent in heaven for the sun. The sun is like a groom coming out of his honeymoon suite like a warrior. It thrills at running its course. It rises in one end of the sky. Its circuit is complete at the other. Nothing escapes its heat. The Lord's instruction is perfect, reviving one's very being. The Lord's laws are faithful, making naive people wise. The Lord's regulations are right, gladdening the heart. The Lord's commands are pure, giving light to the eyes. Honoring the Lord is correct, lasting forever. The Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than tons of pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, even dripping off the honeycomb. No doubt about it, your servant is enlightened by them. There is great reward in keeping them. But can anyone know what they've accidentally done wrong? Clear me of any unknown sin, and save your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me. Then I'll be completely blameless. I'll be innocent of great wrongdoing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And our gospel lesson today is from the second chapter of John's gospel, verses 13 through 22. Listen to the word of the Lord. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. It's just you and me. And I brought, would you like to hold Jesus then? And I, oh, I have Kleenexes everywhere. This is the time of year when I need to blow my nose a lot because it just gets all stuffed up. Does that ever happen to you sometimes? And then, well, well, we get our Kleenex and we blow our nose or sometimes you take medicine, right? Maybe mom and dad or the doctor maybe give you some medicine so that your nose isn't all clogged up. You know, that stuff inside of our nose is pretty important, actually. A little bit of it is. It helps so that all sorts of stuff doesn't get inside of our body. It stops all the yucky things from getting inside our body. But when it gets to be too much, it's hard to breathe, isn't it? Yep. So you might want to know, what is she talking about blowing our nose in children's time, right? That's what all, your, all the grown-ups are wondering about. 
Well, guess what? It really kind of does have to do about our, our, our scripture today. That scripture today, in the temple, that's kind of, there's where people worshiped at that time, kind of like our church. They needed to do some things to worship the, in the way that they were doing it, but they got so busy doing those things, they forgot about why they were there, that they were there to worship. And so Jesus cleaned it out, just kind of like when we blow out our nose, cleaned it all out, because they weren't able to worship because they were busy doing all these other things. I don't know about you, but my days get busy. Does school get pretty busy sometimes? All the stuff you got, and then you got to come home and do some things at home. Maybe you have to do some chores at home and all that stuff. And we get so busy doing all that stuff that we don't always take time to be with God. Sometimes, even here at church, I don't know, but sometimes you get to see your friends and you start talking with your friends and you start talking about everything else. And we have so much fun here that sometimes we forget about why we came here to worship God. So that's why I have my Kleenex today. And that's why I have a, a picture of us blowing our nose. Because during this time of Lent is a time when we start thinking about what can I clean out? What can I clean out of my life that can help me get closer to God? And so I know y'all blow your nose. So when you're blowing your nose next time, I want you to think about that. Let's take a little time and let's say a little prayer to God. Loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for the gifts that you give to us each and every day. We thank you so much for the people that you put into our lives that help us learn more about you and more about your love. We just ask that you would help us to share that love with everyone that we meet. We know that sometimes our lives get so full of so many different things and we are thinking of so many different things that we just don't take time to think of you. We just ask that you would help us to remember each and every day to spend time with you, spend time in your love, and spend time sharing that love with others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Let us offer the words that we read today from the psalmist before we turn to God's word. Let the words of our mouths, the meditation of all our hearts, be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Just over 30 years ago, I had the honor the privilege of being able to study at Jerusalem University and to go and to study the historical geographical backgrounds of scripture. And it was an amazing time. Our first day there, we flew from New York to Tel Aviv, got on a bus, took us into Jerusalem, grabbed all of our stuff, and they said, just take everything in, dump it off. There was one room that we dumped it in. We couldn't even take it to our individual rooms dumped it in one room that was going to be locked. They said, come back out. So we did. We were all tired after flying all that time. But they wanted to get us on a new routine, a new time. So maybe we want to try that next week. Next week is the start of daylight savings time, so we lose an hour, public service announcement. Maybe we want to come here and, you know, gather an hour early. What they did with us, when we got there, we're all kind of tired. They said, okay, here is what we'll be doing for the remainder of this class. We're going to be reading scripture in the locations that it took place. So you can visually be looking out, seeing this geographical setting, and you can read the historical account. So they started us off with Psalm 48, verse 12. Walk around Zion, go all the way around it, count its towers, examine its defenses closely. Tour its fortifications so that you may tell future generations. This is God, our God, forever and always. He is the one who will lead us even to the very end. And so they took us out on sort of a 
nice forced march around the old city of Jerusalem and kept us going. So we'd stay awake, we'd be exhausted that night, but it would get our bodies onto a new schedule. And in the meantime, we got to be impressed with what we were seeing. And it was amazing to walk around the city walls of Jerusalem. At one point to see a young child on a modern swing on top of the walls of the old city. At another point, we came to the area of the Temple Mount. And that first experience of coming face to face with the Temple Mount was amazing. It was just humbling, mind-blowing. Growing up on a farm, you know, I kind of knew the art of stacking bales. So I knew how everything had to go into place, nice and tight. That's the way that the walls of the Temple Mount are. I'm not sure if this is working. There we go. There was just outside of the city, there was a temple model that somebody had built to scale. So after we had walked all around it, a few days later, we were able to go and walk through this city of Jerusalem, about the size of our sanctuary. And what you see on the picture there is a representation of what the temple would have been. The temple, give or take a few feet, was about 180 feet long, maybe 60 feet wide, 50 feet high, three different sections in it. There was the porch area that most people could go to. There was the sanctuary that only a few people, and then there was the holy of holies that only the high priest at one time of year was able to go into and to offer sacrifice. And that sanctuary and the holy of holies were separated by this large, heavy curtain. If that priest had some sin that the priest hadn't confessed, coming into the presence of God would kill them. So they would literally tie a rope around their waist and they would tie a bell on them. So that way people could hear the bell jingling and know they're still alive. And if the bell stopped jingling, they could pull them out and say, okay, who's next in line? Let's go through this once again. Brings new meaning to the fear of God, a fear of being in the presence of God. I don't know how many times I've heard people talk about, oh, I don't want to come into church. You know, lightning might strike. We serve a God, it's a God of love and grace. While I was there, can, next one, they were in the process of putting a new covering on the Alaska Mosque, the dome on top of the Temple Mount. You can see that it is the Western Wall or sometimes called the Wailing Wall. You can see how small all of those people are that are down at the base of it praying. Gives you an idea of the enormous size of the Temple Mount. The temple itself would have been on top of that. So imagine an area the size of our entire church property is about the equivalent of this entire temple mount. These stones are huge and they are put together perfectly. For Jesus and his disciples and for religious leaders to hear Jesus say, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Yeah, right. That didn't make any sense. Now, as we think about what it really meant, as the scripture tells us, Jesus was talking about his body. But the temple, what's more important is not the fact that Jesus' body is somehow better than the temple that they had at that time. It's about where is God's presence? When we think back through history, God's people wandered 
all over the place with this big canvas tent, the tabernacle that they would set up. That was their place of worship. When God's people were exiled, sent off to Babylon, they said, now what do we do? We don't have a place to worship. And God said, settle down there. Plant vineyards, plant gardens, work. Go about your business, but continue to worship me wherever you are. They came back to Jerusalem. Jeremiah helped rebuild the temple. We move throughout history. We come to our modern day. And we've got beautiful churches, sanctuaries, temples, buildings, where we gather together to worship. The temples and the worship spaces, the churches, cathedrals throughout Europe were tall, magnificent, with steeples on top that people could see it from a long distance and know where they had to go to walk to be able to make it to church. There was a time when we had churches that were magnificent. Things happen. Things change. Not too long ago, 1996, there was a fire. That church is no more. Part of the building behind it is, but this sanctuary, this facility was built. When we compare and contrast the different facilities, there was a point in time when it was important for architects to have a long staircase leading up into the church to remind people that you are approaching God, like you're going up towards heaven. I can remember my grandfather's Lutheran church, the pulpit came out of the wall about 30 feet up in the air in the front with a giant staircase in the back, a spiral staircase that the pastor would go up so people could look up and hear the word proclaimed. There came a time when we started realizing, you know, having all those stairs, that's not beneficial for people to be able to gather together. Maybe that isn't the best way forward. And so we build facilities like this that are all basically on one level with almost no steps. Things change as we go through life and we build the world around us a little bit differently. The same is true for our homes. If we take a look downtown, there's all sorts of homes that were built around the turn of the century that are very much tight together, not a huge yard. The downtown streets are there with businesses one right after the other. They're not designed for traffic to flow through quickly. Now we know as the bypass came in, as new developments go in, everything changes. Instead of having porches on the front of the house where people would sit out on their porch and talk with their neighbors, the newer subdivisions now have all these big sweeping, curving streets through them, no sidewalks, large yards. As one of my doctoral professors, Alan Roxborough, likes to say, people, we get in our little bubbles and we zip down the road all alone in that little bubble and pull up to our place of residence. It's not even really a home by a true term. We press a little button, garage door, one of the many garage doors goes up. We pull into our spot. Someone else in our family may pull into another door, into another spot. And then when we go into the house, we close that down so nobody has to see us. We don't have to talk to anybody. We don't have to know our neighbors at all and interact with them. And then we each go to our own little individual spaces within our places of residence. So we don't have to really interact with even our own family members. And we wonder why society is unraveling. We wonder why we all feel so disconnected. Why there's this loneliness epidemic. It's not because 
we're alone, necessarily. By and large, the loneliness epidemic is because we no longer know how to communicate with one another. And spiritually, we no longer know how to communicate with God. We can look at the world around us, and the world around us, it's built based off of what we believe our human needs are. There comes a point in all of our lives that we look back and we say, you know, maybe all of this progress wasn't all progress. Maybe it actually put us backwards a little bit. Same thing is true within the church. Sometimes we look at some of the things that we've been told, this is what a successful quote unquote church needs to do. Here's the program that we need to do. And we realize maybe it's a lot more simple than that. Maybe it's learning how to communicate with one another. Learning how to ask one another, what do you mean by that? As the disciples heard Jesus speak time and time again, we're told that they went alone with him afterwards and said, Jesus, that parable, what, what did it mean? We've had no clue. And Jesus, full of patience, would explain it. The new temple, it's not a new building necessarily. It's not something better than a previous temple. It's how do we worship God and where do we worship God? Where do we meet God? In the midst of all of the anxious commentary going on in the church world today about mainline churches in decline, maybe God is saying, no, I'm going to build something new, better. A way that you can communicate with me better, more often. Instead of us being in control and this great holy place that we gather to worship God, to be in our minds the only place that God is present, and then we walk away and go about our life. What if the rest of our life is really that new temple, that place to communicate with God and where God is communicating with us through that coworker that is so annoying, and maybe that coworker that is dropping the F bomb and everything else, and we really don't want to listen to him, but you know what? Maybe God is actually at work in that person's life, and we can learn something from them. And in so doing, it opens up communication channels and that they're able to hear God through us. The way that we worship, the places that we gather in, it's about connecting with God, connecting with one another, and glorifying God. May we continue to seek God as we go through Lent to realize all of those things that we need to clear out, as Jennifer said, and to be able to focus on what's truly important. Listening to one another and learning to hear God's still, small voice. May we learn what it means to be the temple of God so that we might be able to worship God and worship God together with all of creation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Song of Response, it's number 740.
Lead me, guide me. May this be the prayer of our hearts. In response to God's word, I invite you to stand as we affirm the faith of our baptism as written in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And I invite John to come forward and to share a moment for mission. Good morning, I'm John Neville and I'm on the Buildings and Grounds Committee with uh, Dave Weber and Les Meyer and Ken Previs and our leader Jim Dasso and our uh, liaison with the session, Brian Conrad. So wanted to give you a quick update on Pave the Way. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone that has donated so far. We've uh, gathered uh, uh, $12,833. And right now we don't have a firm date from Northeast Asphalt that's going to be doing the blacktop. Um, we're not number one on their list this year when they start paving, uh, but uh, we're hoping 
that it's going to be sometime in May. Um, We've got uh, things to go over with them, and one of the big things is, is that uh, we have to give a down payment as soon as they tell us that they're coming of $50,000. So um, endowment has graciously uh, offered to match our givings from the congregation of $50,000. So the whole project estimating about $101,000 to do our blacktop, milling off two inches, resealing everything and then restriping all of our um, parking lanes and handicap parking and things like that. So we would appreciate um, your gifts uh, by the 1st of May at least um, so we know how much uh, we can communicate with endowment uh, once we get a firm date uh, established from Northeast uh, Asphalt. So we're hoping for this project to be done um, in May sometime, but uh, we're at the whim of them. So they came in at the best uh, bid. So they came in at 101,000 and we started with other companies. We went to six different companies and we started with $180,000. So we said, no, nope, that's not it. There's gotta be someone else. So Northeast is the biggest, um, asphalt uh, uh, paver in the area. They also did, um, I believe it right at the corner of uh, 4th Street and uh, National down here, uh, Lighthouse Christian. So they did theirs last year and I think they did a fabulous job. They were very pleased. I talked to some people there. So um, we're hoping to get that done, but we need your help. So we've got a long ways to go and we're hoping if you can get your donations into us, um, as soon as possible, we would definitely appreciate that without depreciating too much of our cash to offset the initial down payment. So thank you for your time this morning and uh, pray for your gifts to our church. So thank you. Thank you, John. Invite the ushers to come forward. There are so many needs. It doesn't matter if you are able to give a little or to give a lot. May you give with a joyful heart. That is what the Lord desires. May we give joyfully ourselves as the ushers collect God's tithes and our offerings. Lord, we give you thanks.
for all the many blessings of our life, for all that you have entrusted to us. Take these gifts that we offer to you and our very lives, multiply them, use them to further your kingdom here on earth, to your glory. Amen. Your elders, your deacons have prepared this table for us, for God's people, to share in this holy meal. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table. This is open to all who believe in Jesus Christ. As we go about sharing this holy meal today, May we prepare our hearts and may we know that Christ meets us in a mysterious way. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of abundant life. From before time, you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live into the fullness of your love. God of mystery and promise, you invite us to discover you in the intimate places of ourselves and our lives. You invite us to discover you within the complexities of our humanity, in passionate and tender loving, in struggle and pain, in confusion and unknowing, in flashes of insight and wisdom. You call us to follow you into places of new imagination, intricately woven throughout the realm of this cosmos in the deep rhythms of the ocean, in the unending cycles of day and night, in the seasons 
of life and of death. We praise you that in Jesus, you have made known to us the wonder and richness of our humanity. We give thanks for his life-giving love, for his healing touch, for his vulnerability, for his gentleness. O God, who is known to us in human flesh, send your Holy Spirit on us and on these elements taken from your creation, that this loaf and this cup may be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and we may be the body of Christ, food and life for the world. Hear the silent prayers of our hearts, as well as those groans that we cannot utter. We ask all these things through Christ, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, be all glory now and forevermore. Amen. And now we lift our voices together, praying the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples and shared this holy meal. Taking the bread, he blessed God, gave thanks, and said, This is my body. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the meal, he took the cup again, blessed God, gave thanks, said, This cup is a cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take, Drink, do this in remembrance of me. As often as we share this bread and this cup, we do proclaim Christ's death until he comes again in final glory. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite the servers to come forward. And again, we'll begin with the outer sections. We'll invite you, if you would like to come forward, we'll invite you to come forward and to partake of the bread, and then you can dip the bread in the cup and then proceed around. If you'd like the individual prepackaged ones, you may do that. And after we have served the two outside ones, then Mary will be coming around looking for those who wish to stay in your seats. Let us share in this holy meal.
Let us pray together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Sing together. And we will start the round. This side will follow Carol, this side will follow me.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I think you follow Jesus by doing what he said. And the most important thing that, uh, that I focus on and what he did is when someone actually asked him, like, what must I do to be saved? And he said, well, what do you think? And he's like, well, love the Lord God as yourself, right, with all your heart and soul. And he's like, yeah, well, how do you do that? Love your neighbor as yourself. And that everything was included in the law. The law was summed up in that. And I'm like, well, how do you be saved? Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself, so I think. We are First Presbyterian Church in Fond du Lac. We are Christians serving, learning, and loving. You can find us on the web at www.fdlpresbyterian.org. We are located at 1225 4th Street and have in-person worship on Sundays at 9 a.m.